March 1989. Air Ontario Flight 1363 prepares to leave Dryden Airport for the last leg of a round-trip flight between Thunder Bay and Winnipeg. For many of those on board, it is the first day of a long-awaited winter vacation and the last day of their lives. Friday, March 10th, 1989, just after 9.30 a.m. An Air Ontario passenger jet arrives in Thunder Bay 20 minutes late. It has been behind schedule since leaving Winnipeg that morning after pilot George Morwood delayed the flight to have the wings de-iced. It has already been a frustrating morning for Captain Morwood and First Officer Keith Mills. Before the flight even begins, they discover that the jet's auxiliary power unit is inoperative. Routinely, ground starts are used, but the APU is a sort of backup system directly on the aircraft itself. If uh, both engines on the aircraft were to be shut down anywhere en route, then unless uh, ground start equipment was available, the aircraft would be stranded. As the F-28 jet refuels for the return trip to Winnipeg, Friends Brian Adams and Brian Parizak prepare to board the aircraft. We're participating in the Canadian Elks Curling Championships. Uh, we're supposed to attend it at uh, Red Deer, Alberta, and that's where we were on our way to. Our flight plan that morning uh, was we were going to fly from Thunder Bay to Winnipeg with a stopover in Dryden, and then a connecting flight from Winnipeg to Calgary. Just before 10 a.m., Adams and Perizak take their seats in the fourth row on the left side of the aircraft. Some passengers that morning are on the first day of their winter vacation. Seated on the left side of the front two rows, Brian and Pam Kluwer and their teenage children Lisa and Michael are on their way to Whistler for a week of skiing. Pam Kluwer has flown many times before but this morning, something is worrying her. At least if we go, we'll go together, she confides to a friend. Like the Kluwers, Dan Godin, his wife Susan, and teen daughters Lori and Danielle are on their way to Whistler, a trip that has been booked for several months. Not far away, a woman traveling with her three-month-old baby chats with her seatmate. Close by, in the seventh row, 36-year-old Nancy Eyre looks forward to meeting up with husband John in Winnipeg, where John's firm is planning a going away party. At least one passenger on board is not there willingly. RCMP escorts are taking prisoner Gary Jackson to Calgary to face charges of writing a bad check. 52-year-old Captain George Morwood is a 25-year veteran with a reputation for being a cautious, safety-conscious pilot. He was described by his fellow pilots as one who flew by the book. He had very limited experience, however, on the F-28 jet on which he had qualified only in February of 1989. First officer Mills was uh, 35 years of age he, too, was a low-time pilot on the F-28, having only 65.7 hours of flying time on the jet. An outside expert hired to train pilots on the recently leased F-28s has already resigned in frustration over what he calls Air Ontario's unprofessional operation. They were in a hurry to introduce the F-28s into commercial air service, and they let a lot of the things that should have been attended to go by the wayside. Several times, flight attendant Catherine Say has told her husband that deteriorating safety standards are making her job more dangerous. Her junior flight attendant, Sonia Hartwick, shares her concern. In the last eight months, maintenance has logged more than 170 defects on this particular F-28 alone. Air Ontario instructed its pilots to note snags 
on the aircraft on scraps of paper. And these scraps of paper were passed from air crew to air crew. And uh, they were not to enter these snags in the logbook because if they did, then the aircraft by law would have to be grounded. And they were anxious to keep the aircraft flying for revenue purposes. Now, with Flight 1363 already behind schedule, Sonia Hartwick and the rest of the crew face another setback. Another flight has been canceled, and 10 more passengers are boarding the F-28. So we ended up uh, having to wait for a half an hour while they unloaded some fuel to get the weight down. We ended up being an hour late leaving Thunder Bay. The flight from Thunder Bay to Dryden is without incident, but is well behind schedule as it lands in Dryden at 11.30 a.m. To add to the crew's frustration, by the time the flight is ready for takeoff just after 12 noon, the weather has taken a turn for the worse. The snow squall became very, very heavy and it covered the entire east half of the runway. He was reported to have told the passengers on his aircraft, folks, this looks like a doomed flight today. From the time we got to the Dryden Airport to the time we sat at the end of the, end of the runway, the snow went from coming down really lightly, light dry snow, to heavy, heavy, thick flakes. I would say there was probably a half an inch of snow accumulated on the wings. Numerous witnesses, including two uh, professional pilot passengers, expressed concern about the condition of the wings just before the takeoff. However, uh, no one did anything about alerting the cockpit crew of the danger, which was very obvious. Captain George Morwood has asked Dryden crews about the availability of de-icing, but decides against it based on the jet's lack of auxiliary power. If he shut down the engine in order to de-ice, he could not restart the aircraft because there was no ground start available and the APU was non-functioning. He was faced with the choice at Dryden of grounding the aircraft and stranding his passengers, much to their chagrin and also that of his employers here in Ontario, for which he would be answerable. He decided to go. 12.07 p.m., Friday, March 10th, 1989. Air Ontario Flight 1363 is cleared for takeoff. Possibly the veteran pilot expects the force of the takeoff to sweep the snow from the wings. But a little known phenomenon has already occurred to prevent that from happening. Upon landing, the supercooled fuel in the tanks which touched the wing surface caused the lower layer of the snow on the wings to form black ice on the wings. The crystallization would occur almost instantly. I didn't think the power up was as strong as what it was in Thunder Bay. I don't think the rear wheels ever did come off on the first attempt. And we ended up coming back down hard. I could see that we were probably more than halfway down the runway. On the second rotation, plane came off the ground, started seeing the stripes at the end of the runway as they flashed by and we pulled up off the runway. We heard a couple thuds. Uh, at the time I didn't know what it was. Uh, I realized now we had hit trees off the west end of the runway. Then we seemed to pull out of it. We didn't hear anything. We all thought we had pulled out of it and everything was okay. We thought we were lifting up, but what we were actually doing was flying level right into trees. I can remember the person in front of me turning around and, and screaming, we're going to crash. As senior flight attendant Catherine Say shouts to passengers to keep their heads down, prisoner Gary Jackson asks his police escorts to undo his handcuffs. But there is no time. As we started clipping more trees, the plane started to just be dragged down into them. I remember a real sudden impact. 
and I remember being thrown to the right. I remember seeing white lights. We were still in our seat with our seat belts on, but our seats were not bolted to the floor anymore. We flew forward. It was like hitting a brick wall, and then I, w I was knocked unconscious. What's going through your head is, you know, like this doesn't happen. You know, this doesn't happen here. This happens somewhere else. Friday, March 10th, 1989, 12.11 p.m. Air Ontario Flight 1363 has just crashed in a forested area at the end of Dryden Airport's main runway. Witnesses alert Airport Fire Chief Elmer Perry, who notifies the Dryden and Regional Emergency Response Team, then relays his own crash and fire response crew. For the moment, survivors must fend for themselves. The Fokker F-28 has broken into three pieces. Fire burns on the left wing and inside the stricken aircraft. Overhead racks falling on people. Fire flashing from the front of the aircraft to the back. Intense smoke. Toxic fumes from burning plastics. It was a state of pandemonium. Holes ripped by trees in the side of the aircraft offer escape to those able to free themselves from broken seats and debris. Dan Godin pushes his daughter Lori through one hole, while his wife Susan urges their youngest daughter Danielle out another. Dan helps his wife escape, but decides to stay inside the aircraft to help where he can. He returned at least 12 times to the interior of the aircraft to rescue trapped passengers. Outside, he performed numerous heroic tasks. The woman and her baby are pinned in their seats by the weight of a dead passenger and a burning luggage rack. He managed to shove the mother and the child through the rear emergency exit. After he got them out, he himself dove through an opening in the aircraft through very thick smoke and managed to escape. Unsure of the fate of her fellow crew members and injured herself, flight attendant Sonia Hartwick assists passengers out of the aircraft and away from the crash site. Covered in jet fuel, Terrified prisoner Gary Jackson can't release his own seatbelt because of severe burns to his still handcuffed hands. RCMP Constable Don Crenshaw helps free him, and together prisoner and RCMP escorts clamor out a nearby hole. Brian Perizak wakes up to find himself buried under a piece of fuselage that separates him from his friend Brian Adams. You could hear people screaming and yelling and I started panicking at this point. Oh my God, I gotta get out of here. I finally got my seatbelt off and crawled out. The sight was incredible. The plane had broken into three pieces. It was on fire. Brian was laying on his back. He had told me that his leg was jammed between the seats. So I started clearing debris away. At this point, laying across his legs was a, a body of an elderly gentleman. I rolled him over. There was no doubt that the man had passed away. At this point, the, the flames were probably 20 feet away from us. Actually, the flames were so high and they were catching the overhanging trees on fire and I could see the flames right, right in front of me. We kept on pulling and pulling and pulling and we couldn't, um, uh, we, we couldn't free my foot. I heard uh, someone yelling behind me. I turned around to see a woman that was coming out of the flames. The woman is 36-year-old Nancy Eyre. She has already escaped the plane once, 
but in her confused state, she goes back inside. Now she walks unsteadily towards Parazak and Adams. She was walking something like a zombie with her arms stretched in front of her. Help me, help me, and then she just fell right on top of us. The, the, the skin was dripping off her face. He's yelling, get her off of me, get her off of me. And at this point, a few gentlemen came up and helped the lady that was on fire. The men try to make Nancy comfortable. As severely injured as she is, she urges them to help other passengers who may be still on the plane. Time is running out for many of them, including Brian Adams, his legs still held fast in the debris. I was wearing a tweed jacket that day. You could feel the jacket itself starting to melt. That's how close the fire was. We had time for one last try before Brian had to go. The flames were just that intense. I somehow got my le some leverage off with my right foot on something, and Brian was down with his hands right down to my calf. And we just gave one last pull, and for some reason it just popped out. I took one last look at the plane, and, and all that was intact from what I could see was just the tail end section. There was no way that anyone came out of that part of the plane after we did. As the two men move toward the arriving emergency vehicles, Brian Adams realizes he is not wearing any shoes. He is not the only one. A lot of the people that got out were standing in the snow with no shoes on because from the impact, they blew right out of their shoes. Horrified by the scene in front of them, all emergency teams can do is help survivors away from the crash site. It will be several hours before the fires are put out. Friday, March 10th, 1989. In the aftermath of the crash of Air Ontario Flight 1363, over 40 survivors are taken out by snowmobiles, then driven to Dryden Hospital by ambulances and private car. The more severely injured, including Nancy Eyre, are airlifted to the burn unit in Winnipeg. Although she tells her husband she is not ready to go, Nancy Eyre dies at 11.25 Friday night. Nancy's death raises the final toll to 24. Most of the victims are still on the plane, including pilot George Morwood, first officer Keith Mills, and flight attendant Catherine Say. Of the 24 people that died in the plane crash, they were all within the first seven rows. Brian and I were in seat 4D and 4E, so there was only a few of us that made it out of the first seven rows. The three people beside us in 4A, 4B, 4C were all killed. We were in, on the right side, whereas the left side was hit quite a bit harder. It was just the luck of the draw where you were seated that day. Among the dead, is the entire Kluwer family, Brian, Pam, and children Lisa and Michael. Since neither Brian nor Pam have siblings, their parents lose their only children and their only grandchildren in one terrible moment. As families deal with their tragic loss, the Canadian Aviation Safety Board announces its intention to lead an inquiry into the crash. The government has other plans. On March 29th, I was appointed by the Government of Canada as a commissioner under the Inquiries Act to assume charge of the investigation from the Canadian Aviation Safety Board. My mandate was to inquire into the contributing factors and causes of the crash and to make recommendations in the interests of aviation safety. The Moshansky Commission makes a total of 191 recommendations for change throughout the Canadian aviation system. Most of those recommendations have since been implemented by Transport Canada. Without a doubt, the crown jewel of the Dryden recommendations was the resulting statutory prohibition against takeoff with contaminated wings and the statutory requirement for de-icing aircraft these recommendations have been implemented not only in Canada, but internationally as well. 
While the changes that come with the inquiry are far-reaching, so are the emotional effects of the crash on those who live through it. While she receives a major aviation award for heroism, flight attendant Sonia Hartwick suffers years of nightmares and guilt, which leave her unable to return to her job. Brian Perizak is one of three passengers honored for acts of bravery following the crash. The ceremony was held in Rideau Hall in Ottawa. The Governor General, Rain Etishan, presented it. Well, Brian and I have always, always been good friends. I think we're a little bit closer since the accident. If, if it hadn't been for Brian uh, staying around, I wouldn't be here today. I, I believe it was fate that I survived the crash. Um, yeah, I, was, I was very lucky. In life, we are all passengers on a journey that will take us to our final destination. But for those who survived the crash of Air Ontario Flight 1363 in Dryden, their journey will be one in which nothing is taken for granted. Anything can happen to anyone. I think that uh, what's really changed is the fact that I, I'm not scared to speak out about if I see something that I don't think is safe 